This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by the Virginia Education Association. An investment in teachers today will pay dividends tomorrow. Dignity Memorial. The Dignity Network provides professional and compassionate funeral, memorial, cremation, and cemetery services throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association for jobs, the economy, and public health. Committed to advancing health and economic opportunity for all Virginians. Virginia Tourism Corporation, promoting why Virginia is for lovers, lovers of wine and craft beers, the outdoors, beaches, history, music, and more. Fall in love with Virginia at virginia.org. Additional support provided by these sponsors. and by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. Welcome to This Week in Richmond, a very special welcome to the Attorney General Mark Herring. Mark, we worked with you and the folks around Richmond did when you were in the Senate of Virginia for over a decade. The folks back in Loudoun may remember you from high school or certainly they'll remember you from the Board of Supervisors and the work that you did in your private law practice there. Uh, University of Virginia and then University of Richmond Law degree and now in your second term as Attorney General and we're just delighted to have you on to talk about some of the key issues that really that you're working on and maybe we should start with health care because that's one you've been working on for some time but now there's been some action taken in, in one court that probably intensifies the work that you'll be doing. Yeah. Well, David, thank you for having me back on the show. Um, you know, I've enjoyed working with you over the years as we cover, as you've covered a lot of the issues that the General Assembly and uh, the governor and, you know, we're working on. And you're right, we just got a, uh, a new decision uh, from a court down in Texas mm -hmm. in a politically motivated lawsuit that is designed to try to gut the Affordable Care Act. Uh, you know, we've been involved in a couple of these over the years. There was one in Virginia a few years ago. Uh, we came in to defend the ability of hundreds of thousands of Virginians, many of whom had insurance for the first time, right. to make sure that they could continue to get their insurance. We went all the way up to the Supreme Court, uh, and we were leading the effort among uh, the states to protect it, and we won. And then uh, earlier this year, a group of Republican attorneys general filed suit uh, in nor the Northern District of Texas uh, in a case uh, that we think is really far-fetched and has some flimsy legal theories, but they were very creative in uh, doing some forum shopping, uh, and uh, the judge has bought what I think are some really flimsy legal arguments. It was also a case that the Trump administration chose to side with the Republican attorneys general in an effort to try to uh, eliminate the protections for pre-existing conditions, and the case overall is designed to try to get rid of the Affor Affordable Care Act, which you know, means so much to so many people, uh, whether they buy insurance on the exchange or whether they uh, or someone who has a pre-existing condition. You know, I, I've talked to so many women on the campaign trail last year who told me uh, they are breast cancer survivors, and if these protections go away, they don't think they'll get insurance or it'll be at a rate they can't afford. Their family may not be able to get insurance. So as uh, far-fetched as we think the, the case is, it's dangerous uh, and, and they are, are being reckless uh, with people's lives and their health care. So we just got a decision where the judge down there um, has bought into it. I think uh, it is uh, so uh, flimsy that uh, both liberal and conservative uh, legal scholars think it's ridiculous. So we're going to continue the fight to protect people's health care um, because of what's at stake. It means so much to so many people. Um, and, you know, I'm down there fighting with other Democratic attorneys general to defend the Affordable Care Act to protect people's health care. 
and we're not going to give up. We're not going to take this. Uh, that, you know, this is not over by a long shot. And so as we speak, we're developing a strategy for how to challenge this decision uh, because it's so important to so many people all across the country, including right here in Virginia. And earlier this year, uh, under the governor's leadership uh, with a lot of new uh, Democratic uh, House of Delegate members, we were able to expand Medicaid in Virginia. It's long overdue, but at least we finally did it. Uh, we are on track to sign up 375,000 Virginians mm. for Medicaid expansion, right. and that too could be jeopardized by this lawsuit. So uh, it affects millions of Virginians who have pre-existing conditions, could affect hundreds of thousands of Virginians who are signing up for uh, Medicaid under the new expansion, uh, and, and the, the hundreds of thousands of Virginians who get their health care on the exchange, and I'm going to be in there fighting for them, trying to protect their health care. Now, for those who don't have a Juris Doctor degree or haven't really studied it that much, what is, is the next step the U.S. Supreme Court, or is there a step in between in the fight on that issue? Well, this is at a, a trial court in the Northern District of Texas. The normal course when you go up on appeal is through the Court of Appeals, Federal Court of Appeals, and then to the Supreme Court. Frankly, I think this case is so uh, ridiculous, it should never make it to the Supreme Court. But should they try to push it, you know, we will we'll do whatever we can to protect people's health care uh, because it's so important. You know, you were talking about the, the different parties lining up on one side or the other, attorney generals, and I was thinking there's a fair number of states uh, that have Republican leadership in their state that have have expanded Medicaid, it looks like there would be some of them that would be as concerned as ones in states like Virginia. Well, uh, you know, it's, I can't speak for uh, what some of the other attorneys general do in their states, but what I can say is it is essential uh, that we protect the Affordable Care Act for Virginians uh, and Americans because of, of uh, how it can Im impact so many different uh, people's lives and their health care. Um, and I'm not going to give up the fight. I know there's other issues that we'll talk about uh, in the time that we have that you're working on now, but in your first year, you really made a lot of attention across the Commonwealth in jumping right in on what's called the date rape kits that were just backlogged, and then also on marriage equality. Those were two hot-button issues that you worked on in year one. Yeah. Well, let me uh, pick up with the sexual assault kits first. and. We are literally transforming how Virginia is responding to sexual and domestic violence. Uh, too often, some of these cases were not taken as seriously as they should have been. And when I came into office, uh, there were some two to 3,000 untested uh, physical evidence recovery kits or PERC kits that you know, could contain a lot of important evidence. And so I uh, was able to get some grant funding to test all of the kits because Doing so can help us identify perpetrators who could still be out there. Uh, I, you know, I could not imagine the trauma uh, that uh, a, a survivor of sexual assault goes through, but to also know that your attacker might still be out there. Um, and so I've heard from so many survivors, even ones who may have uh, uh, followed their case through court and their perpetrator may have uh, been convicted, even they feel like just knowing that the Commonwealth understands uh, the, the, the seriousness of the crime and the trauma that survivors go through has helped them get onto a path of healing and recovery. So we, you know, we're going to uh, not stop until every single kid is tested, each case gets a fresh look, and survivors know the results. And it's really, uh, I think, changing how Virginia is responding to sexual and domestic violence. And there are other ways that we've addressed this issue. Uh, I chaired a governor's uh, commission a few years ago on uh, sexual assault on college campuses. And what we found was there was a lot of work to do to make sure that each of Virginia's public colleges and universities has a truly comprehensive prevention program to prevent sexual assaults and sexual violence on college campuses. But we also want to make sure that the supports are there uh, and that students know uh, if there is an incident of sexual assault that they report, that they are going to get uh, the treatment, the, the support, and the compassion that they deserve. Uh, and now, I also want to you know, really emphasize that point because uh, the U.S. Uh, Education Secretary Betsy DeVos 
has proposed some changes that we think could roll back some of those student protections and, and campus protections that we need to keep our campuses safe. And I want folks to know that as long as I'm Attorney General, we're not going to give up those hard-fought gains. Now, what about white supremacy and, and, and the hate crimes? I know that's an issue that, that's really important and one that you're working on. Yeah. Well, I noticed a few years ago that uh, there seemed to be uh, an increase in hate crimes in Virginia and across the country. Uh, and, you know, I've seen it with uh, uh, graffiti spray painted on, on bridges or, or walls, uh, vandalism uh, in mosques threats to uh, Jewish schools uh, or synagogues and you know it seemed to like m with the campaign from 2016 and, and the election of President Trump and his actions after that that these tensions the divisions have only accelerated and that what happened in Charlottesville a year ago in August should have been a wake-up call to everyone mm -hmm. that this is a serious and a growing problem uh, the white supremacist, anti-Semitism, neo-Nazi uh, activity that we're seeing is on the rise. And the state police last year uh, found that there, was, uh, there were over 200 hate crimes in Virginia. Every category of bias saw an increase. And there was a 64% in increase in hate crimes since 2013. And that data parallels the data that the FBI has released showing it's really increasing nationally. So. I have been out uh, with a, a series of proposals to try to address this. Uh, they include uh, updating and modernizing the definition of a hate crime, so it includes gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, and disability. Uh, it would also allow localities to prohibit firearms in permitted events. It would prohibit uh, the kind of white supremacist, heavily armed militias that we saw in August of last year in Charlottesville you know, walking the streets of Charlottesville, that shouldn't happen in Charlottesville or any community in Virginia. And then we also need to give law enforcement the tools to identify these uh, dangerous white supremacist uh, violent groups and, and give them the tools they need to help prevent violence from happening. And some of the stories I've heard from the roundtables that, that we've had around the state, um, you know, are, are really heartbreaking. Certainly those acts of violence that, or the, the acts of hatred that turn violent um, are heartbreaking and, and the victims uh, and the, their families go through so much. Uh, but it also has a, a toxic effect all through society. And we've heard from an Indian American who was uh, living in Hampton Roads and had been there for decades. He said he never really felt discriminated against. He always felt welcome up until a few years ago. Uh, and now he's getting looks and, and sneers and people, others who we spoke to feel like they have to start looking over their shoulder for fear that they could be attacked. Uh, you know, uh, someone who felt like they had to drive a different way home for fear they're attacked. It's just a, a sense of fear and unease among so many ethnic and religious minorities. And as Attorney General, uh, you know, I want them to know I'm going to do everything I can to keep them safe keep their families safe and protect them. Uh, nobody should be discriminated against or live or worship in fear because of who they are or what their background is or, or what their faith is. So some of this will be addressed in the upcoming session then, sounds like. Well, I hope so. And some of these measures we've proposed uh, previously but haven't really uh, gotten the attention from the General Assembly members that I think they should. And that tells me there's still too many General Assembly members who um, are not taking this as seriously as I think they should. And so we've invited legislators to participate in these roundtables around good, the state good. so that they can hear directly from their constituents about how they've been impacted by hate crimes. And you know what? If they have some other ideas about how to address it, uh, I want to work with them. Uh, we can just you know, sit around the table, talk these issues through, and let's make some progress. Um, you know, of course, it, it will also take some community building, education is a common theme that I heard in a lot of these roundtables that you know, we need to educate people about uh, a lot of the, the issues that we're confronting because um, you know, as, as important as the policy changes are, you know, these community building efforts are a big piece of it too. We want our viewers to know that, that they can go on your website, to the Attorney General's website, and can find information on lots of issues. And another one 
is predatory lending. Yeah, and that's a it's a problem. It is. Uh, I have regalvanized our consumer protection section over the last four or five years, and we have done a lot to protect consumers from uh, some bad actors out there who uh, take advantage of consumers, and we've returned hundreds of millions of dollars to Virginia consumers who really need it. We've also had a focus on predatory lending and making sure that uh, those who are financially vulnerable aren't taken advantage of. You know, very often these are short-term, uh, not just high interest rate, exorbitant interest rates uh, that really are financial quicksand. And too often they, they fall, um, they, they violate Virginia's laws, and so we've been very aggressive in enforcing our laws. I also think we need some stronger laws, but I'm going to use the tools I have to protect Virginians. I'll just give you one recent example. Uh, a company called Future Income Payments was singling out uh, older uh, retirees and, and military families for their pensions and claiming that they were helping them with a, a pension, a purchase of their, a portion of their pension. In effect, they were disguised loans at exorbitant interest rates wow. that uh, were really predatory. Uh, we were able to get almost $50 million in uh, debt relief uh, and other, other penalties, and over 1,000 Virginians, uh, most of whom were either uh, military veterans or retirees with pensions. Over a thousand Virginians had been harmed by this, and so we were able to get over fifty million dollars in relief for them and, and other penalties. I think when people are on the website, as, as I have been researching, they'll see that consumer protection part and three easy steps of what to do. So it's it's right there for them. But now an another subject: the need for reform in Virginia's cash bail system. What's what's that about that you're working on? Well, cash bail is uh, one piece of our larger effort to help reform our criminal justice system in a way that makes our system more fair while at the same time advancing our public uh, safety goals. And right now, Virginia's cash bail system, I've called for uh, reform of it because too often it is a system that determines who has wealth rather than who is really a risk to the community. You know, we certainly want people who are a threat uh, to, the, to the community, public safety threat. Uh, you know, we want to we keep the community safe, but we also don't want low-risk, nonviolent offenders sitting in jail awaiting trial when they could be better served under pretrial services. You know, there, uh, there's been a study that shows over half of Virginia's jail population is there awaiting trial. Mm. And so often, these are low-risk, nonviolent offenders that we are housing in the jails, while others who may be more dangerous have financial means and can get released, mm -hmm. which doesn't really increase, that, that doesn't help keep our communities safe. And studies have shown that only, it only takes a very short stay in jail before a downward cycle of debt uh, and and uh, recidivism begins to set in because they lose, you know, they, if they have a job, if they're sitting in jail awaiting trial, they can't show up for work and they lose their job. Uh, they lose the family supports. And so it only takes a very short time in jail for there to be that downward spiral. And last year, there were 28,000 uh, Virginians who were released under some form of pretrial supervision, 94% showed up for, tri for trial, 94% stayed out of trouble, and that tells me mm -hmm. there are better, less expensive ways to make our criminal justice system more fair while at the same time meeting our public safety goals. You know, one of the things I honestly didn't know about until I was on the OAG site was that hardest hit Virginia, hardest hit VA, talking about the initiative and the work on heroin and opioid addiction. Yeah. That's something that's also part of your mission. This is something that I've been working on since I took office in 2014. And you know, Virginia, uh, like the entire country, is suffering from an opioid epidemic. It is taking the lives of over a thousand Virginians. You know, no corner of our commonwealth 
is immune from this. And so we have taken a really uh, broad, multifaceted approach at trying to address this issue. We have stepped up prosecutions against dealers and traffickers who are bringing heroin into our state and profiting off addiction. Uh, we've done over 100 cases involving hundreds of pounds of heroin. But we've known from the very beginning this was a public health crisis mm -hmm. and that we were not going to be able to arrest our way out of it. And so we've really focused a lot on prevention and education. We've done uh, a cutting edge video called Heroin the Hardest Hit to really bring home to young people uh, and their parents just how dangerous these drugs are. Uh, this is a story of real Virginians who have battled addiction and as well as the response that different communities are making. Um, and so we've also gone after uh, uh, the pro health professionals who illegally put these dangerous drugs out on the street. And we've even sued Purdue Pharma where we allege that they, uh, they have misled the public as well as the medical community about the dangers, that, about the effectiveness of the drugs or lack of it, as well as the dangers of their drugs. And what we say is you know, a, a cause and, and a prolonging of this crisis. But it's really going to take everybody, everybody's got a role to play here. Uh, you know, we need to recognize that this is something that can happen to anyone. It has its roots in the medicine cabinet, more so than on the streets. Uh, and there's some simple things that everyone can do to make their home and their community safer. If you have unused medication uh, in your medicine cabinet, safely and properly dispose of it. There are a lot of disposal sites that you can take it to. Make sure that your medication is locked at home because a child or a grandchild might get their hands on it and, and misuse it. So, you know, there are some things that we can all do to help make our communities and our homes safer. You know, before our time runs out, people hear a lot about Attorney General's opinions. Well, they may not know if they go on your site, they can read about those opinions. And one of the interesting ones that I've heard referred to as a Mother's Day opinion came out near Mother's Day was your opinion pertaining to the ERA mm -hmm. and that uh, it would still be appropriate for Virginia to consider that. I think so. And wouldn't it be great if Virginia put our nation over the top in terms of the number of states who've ratified the ERA? This is something that I've been a supporter of for a long time. It's long overdue. It would uh, make sure that everyone is treated equally and, and women are not discriminated against, and that would be a part of our Constitution. The opinion you talk about, some people had said, well, you know, the time has passed right, for right. when states can ratify it, but we you know, researched the issue and found that uh, the, the Congress can always extend the time for ratification, and so it is appropriate for the General Assembly to consider. And I hope the General Assembly passes, and I hope Virginia puts us over the top. Attorney General Mark Herring, there's been some news out about uh, you have interest in another position sometime in, in the future. Uh, uh, any comments on that? I, I did confirm what my future plans might be, that uh, you know, I feel like the work that I've done on gun violence prevention, on fighting for people's health care, on standing up against the, the Trump agenda has been some of the most important work that I've been involved in. Uh, I'm proud that you know, I've helped to play some part in helping to build a, a safer, uh, more economically dynamic, more inclusive Commonwealth. Um, and that I've done that as a county supervisor, a state senator, and now as attorney general. And you know, I think looking forward, the best way I can continue that work would be as governor. but uh, that's down the road, and there's still a lot that I, my team and I want to accomplish. Uh, a lot I'd like to do as Attorney General. You know, we're working on the hate crimes initiative right now to try to combat hate crimes in Virginia. Uh, we're working on uh, criminal justice reform, you know, regalvanizing our consumer protection section. There's a lot out there. I still have, have a lot of work still out there to do as Attorney General. Now, there's some, some comment made about your, you said before you would resign, but I saw where PolitiFact and, and said that that was not a flip on your part because you aren't really formally campaigning for attorney general, but you've just indicated that you have interest in that position. Yeah, you know, like I said, that's, that's uh, down the road quite a ways. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do uh, as attorney general, and uh, I'm looking forward to working with the General Assembly in the upcoming session. Uh, the governor just came out, uh, laid out a, some really exciting budget proposals. I think it's a 
a fiscally responsible budget that also puts some really important investments in education, in, uh, in broadband, uh, in housing, and also provides some targeted tax relief for working Virginians so that they can keep more of their paycheck. Thank you very much for being on This Week in Richmond. I'm getting the signal that our time is up, but thank you. Thank you for having me. This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by the Virginia Education Association. An investment in teachers today will pay dividends tomorrow. Dignity Memorial. The Dignity Network provides professional and compassionate funeral, memorial, cremation, and cemetery services throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. Virginia Hospital and Health Care Association for jobs, the economy, and public health. Virginia Tourism Corporation, promoting why Virginia is for lovers, lovers of wine and craft beers, the outdoors, beaches, history, music, and more. Fall in love with Virginia at virginia.org. Additional support provided by these sponsors. and by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you.